Hello everybody, it's Skelegon again. Welcome back to the Bone Zone, or as I should say in this case, the Zone, as I'm going to be talking about the 1979 Soviet science fiction film directed by uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, known as Stalker. Uh, so this movie is based loosely on the 1972 novel titled Roadside Picnic. That novel, as well as the screenplay for this movie, were written by Boris and Arkady St Strugatsky. Now, the reason why I picked this movie is lately I've been watching mostly horror movies, so I thought I'd take a leap and try some Soviet-era films. I mean, that is, the, of course, the most logical next step that someone would take, right? So anyways, after this film, the next two movies I will be doing reviews for, which I may or may not do the audio reviews for them. I might just do one of them. Who knows? We'll see. Anyways, those two movies will be the Soviet World War II epic Come and See, and the Soviet-Japanese co-produced film Dorsu Uzala, which is directed by the legendary Akira Kurosawa. Now, this movie, uh, Stalker, before I get into my predictions, I'm going to be watching the Criterion Blu-ray, um, well, the, you know, the Criterion edition of the Blu-ray. As for those other two movies, um, Dorsu Uzala and uh, Come and See, I will be getting those from the library because... These movies are, those movies are actually pretty hard to find. You, buying a copy on Amazon is, like, ridiculously expensive. Luckily, the library has it. So, I just want to take this chance to say, you should check out your local library. You can find all sorts of cool things you may not have found otherwise, or maybe hard to find. I went to the library uh, yesterday with my son, because they have a nice little kids area there. And they also sell books. They sell, like, you know, old-use books they're getting rid of. I've managed to find find a copy of Rosemary's Baby, first edition. Well, the novel, not the movie. But uh, anyway, so that novel, I got that, the first edition, in pretty good condition. I got that for, um, it was supposed to be $3, but I think the lady at the counter thought it was just a regular hardcover. And I got it for a dollar. I also got the Hellbound Heart, which you may know as the novel that, uh, the Clive Barker novel that Hellraiser is based off of. So that'll be interesting to read and see what differences are between that and the movie. So yeah, if you know, check out your local library. They usually have, um, they usually sell old books they're getting rid of. You can find all sorts of cool stuff. I saw um, a hardcover version of Hannibal, which, you know, I'm not really too into Hannibal. But, you know, if you are, you, you know, who knows what kind of movies, what kind of books, and uh, they also do sell old DVDs and CDs, most of them do, I find. So, yeah, take check out your local library. Um, that's my PSA of the day. So, anyways, back to Cheeky Breaky. Before I get into expectations proper, I should preface this by saying I'd seen some Italian horror movies before I had reviewed the last two ones that I had done reviews for. So, I kind of knew what I was getting myself into in terms of, you know weird writing but good music and cheesy special effects that kind of thing i have not seen any russian films before so i'm really not sure what to expect and i'm imagining they are quite a bit different than say an italian movie from the 80s compared to an american movie from the 80s i'm assuming the difference between an american movie from the 80s and a or 70s and a russian uh, Soviet film from the 70s and 80s. I'm assuming the difference between those is more profound as there's, you know, the whole Iron Curtain, so there's a lot less uh, cultural exchange going on. There's a lot more cultural isolationism, so it's going to be a, you know, completely different sort of uh, endeavor. What I have seen of Soviet-era productions, I've seen a few Soviet-era cartoons on YouTube, so, and from the memes I've learned of i'm pretty sure i'm going to expect well what i'm going to expect from this movie is that it's going to be very long it's going to be it's going to be very contemplative there's going to be very little emphasis on the actual narrative of the movie it's going to mostly take the form of like these like you know shots of like trees and like characters staring off into the trees while they're thinking and there's going to be um lots of sort of philosophical dialogue that doesn't really make sense and i'm expecting nothing of okay so it's hard to talk about stalker without talking about the video game series stalker which became an internet cult favorite uh famous you know for the all the memes and slav squatting and all that kind of accompanying jokes from what i understand this 
movie is nothing like the games, and then the games are first-person shooters uh, with horror elements where you fight, like, mutated dogs and the wreckage of Chernobyl. I played a little bit of Shadow Over Chernobyl, which I think was the first game in the series, but it was a, a PC first-person shooter, and I'm gonna sound like a total plebe, but I'm not a big first-person shooter person. Well, at least not for PCs. I do like the Halo games. Again, I'm a total plebe. And I like, um, you know, all the classic the GoldenEye and the, the other N64 first-person shooter James Bond game, which I think is better than GoldenEye. But anyways, so I'm assuming this is going to be nothing like the video games. It's going to be nothing like the other post-apocalyptic um, first-person shooter series, Eastern first-person shooter series I'm familiar with, which is um, Metro. I'm assuming this is going to be just like kind of like two dudes walking around in uh like the woods and they're gonna look at trees and be like these trees are like my life my life is dead and it's just gonna be like a bombed out tree or something i don't know uh yeah so i have been walking to this pretty blind so it'll be interesting to see and i do notice that i didn't give you a plot summary like I normally do. I just remembered that. So for this, I'll just read you off the plot summary from the back of the Criterion Blu-ray collection disc. So this says, um, Stalker, and then it lists the name in Cyrillic, which is like, looks like it says like, Tank I don't, I don't know, I don't read Cyrillic. It, I know it's not like just reading English letters or Roman, whatever. Anyways, so Andrei Tarkovsky's final Soviet feature is a metaphysical journey. Ooh, that's gonna be fun. Journey through an enigmatic post-apocalyptic landscape and a rarefied cinematic experience like no other. A hired guide, the stalker, leads a writer and a professor into the heart of the zone, the bone zone, the restricted site of a long-ago disaster, where the three men eventually zero in on the room, not to be confused with the, um, that other movie, The Room. A place rumored to fulfill one's most deeply held desires. Again, completely different from that other movie, The Room, which fulfills nobody's desires. Adapting a science fiction novel by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky, Tarkovsky created an immense world, oh, sorry, immersive world with a wealth of material detail and a sense of organic atmosphere, a religious allegory, and a reflection of contemporaneous political anxieties. A meditation on film itself, Stalker envelops the viewer by opening up a multitude of possible meanings. Wow, that sounds really pretentious, but, you know, I'm a total plebe, what do I know? Um, I will see you on the other side. Thank you for listening. And I'm back. Okay, so I just watched Stalker, um, the Russian movie Stalker. So, uh, let me start off by saying, I feel this is important to address, that there are movies which are enjoyable to watch that you'll want to rewatch over and over again. And then there are movies which you appreciate that you watch them, but you don't think you'll really need to revisit them. This is a case of that where I feel like it's a very well-made movie, but it's also a two, and a, a two hours and 40 minutes in which barely anything happens. So it's not a movie I would really dedicate uh, i would you know go out of my way to dedicate free time to re-watching i would recommend that you watch it at least once though because it is a it is a very well-made movie even though it is it is pretty boring at times i will admit and i know i'm coming off as a total plebe for saying that because this is one of those movies where you have to have a really high q and um to enjoy it and if you don't like it you're well you're just an idiot plebe who probably likes larry the cable guy but <laughs> anyways so the movie stalker it's it's an interesting movie um the i'll do a little bit of a plot summary because like i said there's really not much going on in the movie plot wise it's more about the interaction between the characters more than anything so in the opening scene, we're given like a kind of like a a text crawl telling us that a few years, about 20 years ago, there was a mysterious incident that occurred in this area, which resulted in the area being cordoned off and being dubbed the zone. Now, 
they said they sent military in to investigate. No one ever returned. So this zone is a kind of closed off area from the rest of the world. And there's a military blockade around it. You can't get in. They will shoot you on sight if you try. But that doesn't stop the people known as the stalkers from going in and investigating it. And see, the thing is, there's this room in the within the zone that is said to grant your deepest subconscious desire. So obviously that attracts a lot of people. And the main character of the movie is one of those stalkers. Now, one thing I will, I think it's important to mention is... I believe there's only one named character in the entire movie, the bartender named Luger. Other than him, every other character is just referred to by their position or their job, if you will. For example, the main character, the, the stalker, and then he has his wife, who I think is only ever referred to as the stalker's wife. And then their daughter, who they nickname Monkey. And then, like, the other, but their side characters kind of... Uh, the main, so the three main characters of the movie are the stalker, the professor, and the writer. The the stalker agrees to transport the writer and the professor into the zone so that they can go to the room and have their wishes granted. Now, so in the beginning of the movie, they're outside the zone. And it's interesting to note that all the scenes outside the zone that are from the stalker's perspective are shot with this kind of ugly yellow filter. It's like a piss yellow filter. It looks like Deus Ex Human Revolution on steroids. And it does open also with a stealth, uh, well it doesn't open, but um, shortly you're led into a stealth sequence where they're trying to uh, sneak into the zone and escape this uh, sort of cop on a motorcycle who's patrolling the area and then Inevitably, they get caught. The guards open fire on them, so but they manage to get through, and they're getting shot at. But they escape through into the zone, and then once they get into the zone, the color, the film becomes you know in color again, and it's you know, I watched the Criterion Blu-ray version. You know, everything was it was really nice quality film. You know, every the forest is this beautiful forest. But anyway, so they're now in the zone, and. From there on, they have to follow the stalker's orders because the thing about the zone is nothing makes sense in the zone. It's mentioned that no two, every time you enter the zone, the zone changes and that if you don't obey the zone, something bad will happen. Now, this is what I feel like is probably the one of the things I like least about the movie is that this movie has a very uh, tell-but-don't-show approach to things. We're told throughout the movie that you have to obey the zone or something bad will happen and that people have a nasty habit of disappearing and or getting killed or coming back uh, mutated, it's implied. You never really, nothing ever really happens while they're in the zone. I think it's maybe supposed to be like a testament to the stalker's uh, knowledge of the zone that he's able to successfully guide them through the zone. Without anything major happening, the only time there is sort of something supernatural happens is when the writer decides he's had enough. Early on, the writer decides he's had enough of the stalker, you know, making them go in a circuitous route, even though the room is, they mentioned, like 200 square feet, uh, 200 square meters directly in front of them. They have to take a super roundabout, twisting route. Otherwise, you know, something will bad happen. But the writer, he decides, oh, I don't, who who cares? That's all just hooey booey. So he decides to go on ahead. And as he approaches the entrance, he hears a voice tell him to stop. And then he turns around and says, who, who told me to stop? And they're like, I didn't. So then he's like, oh, that's kind of spooky. I guess I'll turn around. And then they, you know, take a secure, circuitous route. And that's kind of most of... What that's kind of like most of the action is that like basically, well the non-character action I should say much of this movie is just them kind of walking around the woods or walking around in tunnels and like it's really dramatic but it's kind of boring. This it it's so slow. It's just like kind of padded out and then finally the movie really kicks in right at the end when they reach just outside the room. They're about to enter it. And that's when they have their big crisis. Because, you see, 
the stalker tells them that once they get into the room, they will have, you know, their wildest, well, they'll have their most deepest subconscious desire granted, but they have to basically prostrate themselves and essentially pray and recount their life to the room. This creates a problem because the journalist, or the writer rather, he is who is the most cynical of the group. He refuses to give in. He chastises the stalker, calling him a czar and a fool of God and all this. Because, you know, he's this very materialistic, cynical guy who earlier in the movie laments that he's, he's sort of this nihilistic character who laments, you know, the whole sort of God is dead thing. But when he's faced with the option of getting his innermost desire granted or but having to admit his faults, he refuses to, you know, surrender his pride. The other sort of conflict that comes up is that it turns out the... Professor, who is the most mysterious character up until this point, because he ver very rarely talks and doesn't really say why he wanted to go there. It turns out there was a bomb hidden in the zone um, from shortly after it appeared, and he knew about it from these last 20 years. And he uh, decided that now he's going to go there and blow up the room because, guess what, he doesn't want a, a, you know, a dictator or a madman being able to have their wishes granted. Ultimately, they it kind of just ends with the the professor just sort of taking the bomb apart and throwing it away and them sitting there having a chat and deciding hey maybe none of us will go in the room and they all leave and then they go home and the stalker meets up with his wife and they decide to take home this dog that they met in the zone and it's kind of you know, he goes home and his wife and him talk about what happened and then his daughter reads a book and, oh, it turns out his daughter can move things with her mind, which I don't remember if I mentioned earlier, but it one of the very few sci-fi elements actually to the story is that people who stay in the zone for a prolonged period of time, they they get like sort of mutated genes and the stalker's daughter, Monkey, she, like, it it's just she's like crippled but she can so she can't walk but she can move stuff with her mind and it's kind of you know one thing i will mention that's interesting is there's two scenes at the end that are from the perspective of monkey after they get back and those scenes even though they take place outside the zone are in full color they don't have that gross yellow filter i think that's pretty interesting i think what that is supposed to symbolize is that is a theme throughout the movie which I have a quote here I'll read to you. Just let me get that pulled up. Weakness is a great thing, and strength is nothing. When a man is just born, he is weak and flexible. When he dies, he is hard and insensitive. When a tree is growing, it's tender and pliant, but when it's dry and hard, it dies. Hardness and strength are death's companion. Pliancy and weakness are expressions of the freshness of being, because what has hardened will never win. And I think that ties in with another line or uh, quote later on towards the end of the movie after they get back and the stalker is uh, laying in bed and he's distraught from his excursion he just had. He says to his wife, my God, what kind of people are they? And his wife says, calm down. It isn't their fault. They should be pitied, not abused. And then Stalker says, their eyes are blank. They are thinking how not to sell themselves cheap, how to get paid for every breath they take. They know they are born to be someone, to be an elite. They say you live but once. How can such people believe in anything at all? I think it's a pretty interesting, uh, you know, set of quotes there. It kind of sums up, I think, Stalker's character in that he is disillusioned with the world. He sees everyone as morally bankrupt or just sort of nihilistic. And it's also worth noting that Stalker is explicitly a religious character, whereas the writer and the professor are both sort of atheistic communist characters, I guess you would say. Though, um, I don't know if it's really fair to say that the professor or the writer rather is uh, explicitly communistic 
he is sort of the most bourgeois of the characters, but then again, communism itself is a sort of an inherently bourgeois philosophy, but that's neither here nor there. Um, essentially, that the stalker, he, I, I, what I, how I view this is I view that the room is sort of a metaphor for a higher purpose or God or religion, if you will. And the stalker sees himself as a kind of like a priest f figure whose duty it is to deliver these people who have nothing and that uh, kind of show them, give them what they want in life. But the thing is, the, those same people have to be willing to admit that they are helpless and that they need a higher purpose in their life. They need the room. They have to admit that. But you have the characters... You basically have the professor who wants to destroy the room because he views it as a threat. He sees, he thinks it exists only as a tool that will be used by, for evil, which is extremely uh, a very communist view about uh, religion, a very Marxist view. And then you have the writer who wants it at first only basically only out of selfish goals he's there because he's seeking meaning and he thinks he can find authenticity through the room but when he realizes it's not just going to be an easy fix it's something that he actually has to put an effort to and admit that he isn't perfect he becomes disgusted and repulsed by it and then so after those two refuse to you know partake in the room and they return back, the stalker is just distraught, and he says he's never going to try to bring anyone to the room again, he's never going to offer anyone this happiness because no one wants it, and he sees the world as having basically rejected the room, and saying the room, the world is saying it doesn't need the room, even though the world is miserable. So that's what I think this movie is ultimately about, and I, I feel like that's just my interpretation of the movie. I feel like it could be read into other ways, but like I said, that's just my interpretation. I would still recommend you watch the movie, though, because it is a really gorgeous art film, and it does bring up a lot of cool point, old interesting points. I would recommend it for people who like art films. I would recommend it for people who like the color yellow. I would recommend it for people who like, uh, I don't know. It's... It's definitely not for everyone, though I would recommend everyone watch it, as weird as that sounds. It's not a bad movie, it's just not a very exciting movie, but not all movies have to be exciting. It reminds me of this debate, I uh, or sort of a meme debate that they used to have on uh, the video games board on 4chan back a while ago, that uh, fun is a buzzword, and that you shouldn't, uh, basically, you shouldn't judge something on whether or not it's fun. I feel like if you go th look at movies exclusively through the lens of is it fun to watch, you're gonna, you're looking at things the wrong way. Because this isn't a fun movie to watch. You're not gonna like sit there and be like, wow, this is a lot of, I'm really having a great time. It's more of a movie about where you're supposed to contemplate the characters and the situation and just sort of think about things in general. So if you like movies that are that really make you think, they really get your noggin jog and really get all activate your almonds, I would really recommend Stalker. If you going into this thinking you're going to be getting um, like dudes in gas masks fighting mutants, you're coming to the wrong place. Uh, from what I understand, the Stalker video games actually more closely follow the novel Roadside Picnic, which is more a bit more straight sci-fi as opposed to this, which is sort of this, like, art house theosophical debate. So, uh, that's about all. Um, I should be reviewing Come and See next, which is, like I said, a Russian World War II movie. Uh, that will be pretty interesting. That I expect that maybe even today um, or later this week. That's about all. This is Skelligun signing off.